Always at the beginning there is water. It was in the oceans where the moon holds dominion that life began. We are born out of waters. And throughout our lives we are part of the cycle of water, a cycle that begins and ends in the clouds. These hardened bones that are the mountain fastness, impregnable, immutable, yet the rock itself is fissured with innumerable waterways, the capillaries of the earth, from which the water that fell as rain and snow hours or years ago emerges in bright burbling springs. To walk a while beside these clear singing streams is to remember our own beginnings. There is a melodic playfulness in the plashing and splashing, an urgency and excitement in the rhythm of the tumbling cascades, and a linguistic quality to the gurgish eddies between root and rock. To journey along the river from source to sea is an immersive experience, a passage from birth through the youthful exuberance of spring to autumnal old age. It is early spring in the buzzarding foothills, and though winter frosts still glisten over moss and bark, life is stirring beneath, and our river is surging as sap up the roots and trunks of trees, awakening buds and illuminating the bouldered riverbank with a pageant of colour. After the long winter sleep, the sound scents and vibrant yellow greens and blues are like a draught of pure, clean water after a drought. Water is being drawn up the tiny tubules of the tall beech trunks to a height of 70 feet or more, spreading along the topmost twigs to a vast acreage of rippling green. There is a whole world in the high canopies, hidden from our horizontal view, a world filled with light and air, filigree leaf and feather, a world dancing with the wind and the weather. The rushing pools glimmer with spilled diamonds and the unfurling canopies filter sunlight. It's a gentle light, enlivening and easy on the eye, allowing the pupils to open still further to take in the finest detail of awakened life teeming about us. There is reassurance in the continuity of growth springing from decay, in the faithful progression from snowdrop to primrose and an enemy, then lilac glades of bluebell, pink campion and golden celandine. There are pressed thoroughfares through the wild garlic, the nocturnal rounds of fox and badger. Tufts of wool and moss are being tucked in among the thorns and lined with soft feathers. The peeling of thrushes, blackbirds and robins from their topmost perches carries out over the river bank at evening and fills the woodland halls to brimming with the dawn chorus. By high summer the warmed waters in the thickened black pools has shallowed and an edge world occupied by pond skaters and water boatmen emerge in the slack waters. The midsummer river and its bower of trees fall into an enchantment now. The light beneath is deep green and heavy with honeysuckle, wild mint and the earthen taste of drying moss on the exposed boulders midstream.
the Welsh Llee Oust marks the first spate and the rumbling onset of autumnal floods that replenish the thirsty pools. And though there may be warm days still ahead, the time of ripening fruit is upon us, and the silver flash of spawning sea trout and salmon have entered the river and are pressing upstream. We meet them here in the lower reaches where the water meanders in lazy circles and deepening pools. The fasting salmon are all ready in the autumn of their lives and heading into winter and their final push on up the gravel tributaries of their birthplace in the upper valleys. There are sweeping changes afoot. We feel it through the mellow light dappling between the ochred leaves. And with each freshening wind, a Jacob's cloak of reds, browns and yellows comes tumbling down the thundering waterfalls. Leaves lodged in the current glimmer like gemstones in the jeweled green of the rapids. And with October, the swaying branches of overhanging oaks release their rain of ripened acorns. There is the scent of steeped vegetation and decay, of leafy teas from the silted islands of tangled twigs in the slack water, and all along the river bank, a frenzied feasting on ruby ripe berries and nuts, with a whispering of leaner times ahead from the winds, turned north northeast and blowing down the mountain passes. We too have slowed in our pace, grown weary like the river from our long journeying, and paused by the swaying reed beds heavy with seed. The last sedge warblers have flown south for winter, and wintering ducks and waders newly come from the frozen tundras of the north dabble and sift the mudflats. The broadened pools are tidal here, the moon holds sway once more, and twice a day the grey-black mullet ride the upsurge of salt water, lipping along the silted sandbanks, leaving ripples of shimmering silver in the wake of their fins. Above the piping plovers we hear the soughing of sea waves just over the dunes. One more turn and we glimpse the wide sweep of the rock-pooled bay beyond. There is a quickening in these last moments as the fresh water reaches journey's end, running excitedly over the shingled shallows, eager to return to the sea. The water's song is joyful, but the experience for us is bittersweet, and there is a mournful quality to the curlew's call out on the spit, a sense that in this dissolution and transition something is being lost, even as the accomplished adventure enters its new beginnings. But there above the blue bay, under a wide arching sky, white sails are gathering, a churning and billowing, filling their holds with fresh water and mustering for the mountains once more. <laughs> 